Okay, I've got about 115. <clears throat> so, can everybody hear me? Okay. So, the quiz this uh, Thursday on the 25th, which is the sixth lecture quiz, um, let's have that be over sections 9.1 and 9.2 in chapter. What one PowerPoints, the, the chapter lectures that you put up, would that just be the first one or would that be the second one also? I couldn't tell you. Oh, okay. I just, I just not remember how I broke them down. I, I wish I could give you an answer real off the top of my head because I just don't remember how I chopped those up. But I think if you go in there, you, you can pretty quickly and easily find where one ends and where the next begins and vice versa. Um, so section 9.1 <clears throat> is um, basically just covering basic terminology, chromosome, gene, phenotype, genotype, um, how the DNA is packaged, um, how the nitrogenous bases complement one another within DNA, T opposite A, C opposite G. Um, it also goes into replication of DNA. And I will say that the book goes into more detail as it describes both what are referred to as the leading and lagging strands. I'm not going to expect you to know the difference between lagging and leading strand synthesis of DNA. So when you watch the, the Zoom lecture, um, I don't distinguish between those two. Um, so don't worry about lagging strand and leading strand. It's, it's two different ways in which DNA is added as the, as the parent strand replicates. And then section 9.2, <clears throat> basically talks about transcription and translation and the role that messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA play in the eventual synthesis of a protein. Okay, so in essence, we're talking about from pages 268 to... Um, 268 to 284, sort of the left hand half of that. So, okay. Any questions on what's going to be on the quiz? Because by now, you should be definitely into chapter nine. Um, in fact, we have the end of nine and chapter 10 listed for this week, if you look on the schedule. And I'll, I'll just also mention as I think of it, chapter 10, which is entitled Genetic Engineering, A Revolution in Molecular Biology. Um, this was a lecture that I did last um, spring. And I don't cover the entire chapter because it's just, it's too in-depth, it gets too te technical. Um, but uh, it will, it'll cover the topics that I feel you need to know. It's actually a rather short chapter as I peruse through this but it's, it's very technical stuff. So we bounce around a little bit in chapter 10. How about questions on stuff you've been studying? Chapter nine, chapter eight stuff. Um, one thing, again, sorry to interrupt, but as I see this, I want to mention that we have our second exam next Thursday, a week from Thursday on the 1st. 
And um, if you're wondering what's going to be on the test in terms of the chapters, it's going to be six, seven, eight, and nine. I know that sounds like a lot of chapters, and it is four, but we're we're omitting quite a bit of nine. I'm sorry, not nine. We're not including any of ten on the exam. I was thinking part of 10, we kind of omitted different aspects of 10, but that's not on the second exam. So you got to go back basically to the introduction to the viruses chapter, that's six. And then we did, we did microbial nutrition, ecology, growth, that's seven. And then the metabolism chapter was eight and the um, microbial genetics was nine. And the format of that second exam will be very, very similar to the format of the first. In fact, all of the formats of all the exams are the same pretty much. And that would be um, multiple choice, uh, maybe some short answer, and your choice of probably a couple essays. Each worth 90 points. The exams are each worth 90. And again, you can reference the syllabus. It's all on the syllabus. All right. Enough talking, questions about anything, quizzes, exam, chapters, how you feeling about this material. Don't everybody speak at once. I'm feeling all right about it, I guess. Okay. Now, if you had me for A and P, then like the metabolism chapter, this chapter nine that we wrapped up this week on microbial genetics, um, we talked about transcription and translation um, in, in A and P one, but some of you didn't have me for A and P one, and I don't know to what extent whoever you did have talked about this at all in, um, I think it's probably chapter four of the whole text if you took a &P here in Olean, we used, we used this book, if you remember. So you hear me say in some of the PowerPoint lectures, go back and review in your a &P notes. Um, so if you, if you didn't cover this much, then this can be a little, a little daunting. So you, you got to tell me where you are with this, because I can't read minds. You know, where are you with transcription and translation? Are you comfortable with it? Are you totally lost? Uh, this is the problem with Zooming. I can't read. I can't even see 80% of you. So I can't gauge faces either. Can we just go over it, the transcription and translation? Sure. So let's um, pull up chapter nine, PowerPoint. Okay, everybody see the first slide there? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Yes. Yes, thank you. So let's go to, let's see, what section should we do here?
All right, so let's let's give you sort of the overall picture first, and then we can break it down into bite-sized pieces. So what we've got is our, of course, DNA molecule. Now, this is likely representing a, a single looped prokaryotic chromosome because many bacteria have just a single circular looped chromosome. You remember hearing about that recently, probably. And um, so when the cell goes to extract information from this chromosome, when it goes to utilize the genome held within that chromosome, the genes within that chromosome, we can think of each of those genes as sort of having the instruction booklet for the production of a protein. Now that's a very simplistic description and isn't totally accurate, but for our purposes, it'll work. So there's gonna be some segment on this chromosome where we will begin transcription and there'll be an ending point where we'll stop transcribing that, that gene, that DNA of the gene. A gene is a, is a discrete unit of the chromosome made up of base pairs, DNA base pairs. And in the process of transcription, does anybody know what is produced? When DNA is transcribed, what is, what is manufactured by the cell? It's RNA. RNA. Well, it's RNA, you're right. It's, it's really all three kinds, as you see here listed, transfer, messenger, and ribosomal. Um, we don't really focus much on the transfer and the ribosomal other than we talk about what those things are and how they play a role in the next part of the process called translation. But, but technically, all RNA is transcribed from DNA. Um, we focus mostly on this middle guy here called messenger RNA. I shouldn't say mostly, but we talk about its synthesis more than we talk about how the T or the, or the R RNA is made. But once the DNA is transcribed into the various types of RNA, then these three guys are gonna work together to translate that into protein. So you see the blue structures here, these represent the small and large subunits of the ribosome made up of this RNA. And these kind of funny clover leaf shaped yellow guys, as you can see labeled, are the transfer RNAs. And what is this little green guy right here I'm pointing to with my pointer? That little triangle, you know what that is? This will really test your knowledge if you've been studying. Amino acid. Very good. It is an amino acid. And then, of course, you link those together and we make a protein. And that's the ultimate goal here, right? Is to make a protein. That's what the cell does. Ultimately, the instruction for making that lies in the DNA. But it first has to be transcribed. Okay, so here's transcription. This is the same diagram you have in your book on page 279. So you might remember I said that transcription begins at a certain region of the DNA and ends at a certain region of the DNA. And so here we see, why did that do that? Here we see what's called the promoter region. This is where it starts. Promoter, promotes transcription, promoter region of the DNA. And here's the termination region where we're gonna end transcription. Now, this gives you the sense that this is just a little bitty piece of, of DNA we're gonna transcribe. The reality is it could be much longer than, than this. Um, but you have to start somewhere and you have to end somewhere. And one of the most important players in the process of transcription of the, of the DNA is this enzyme called RNA 
polymerase. It's an extremely important enzyme. Why do I know it's an enzyme? It ends in ACE. Right, ends in ASE. Remember that? Does anybody know what RNA polymerase is actually doing here? Starting at the promoter region, and, it's, and you see it's moving along, isn't it? The, the, the DNA. It's doing something here. What's it doing? Anybody know? Binds to the DNA. Unzips it. Or yep, something. That's, that's one important thing that it does is it breaks the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. You can see they've been broken here, haven't they? Now, you can't see the hydrogen bonds here in the yet to be transcribed DNA. But what can you see that you know indicates that hydrogen bonds are present? What do we see in here? What are the blue and the red things indicating here in the center of the double helix? The bases. Right, those are the nitrogenous bases. So if we have a C here, we have a G below it. If we have a T here, we have an A below it. Does everybody know what I mean by that? Give me a thumbs up if you do. Give me a thumbs down if you don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> Samuel gives me the literal physical one. I want you to use your, your technology. <laughs> Okay. Does anybody not know what I mean when I say a T here, an A there, a C, G, a C there, a G there? I assume you, you know what I'm talking about there. If you don't, you're going to be totally lost with this. So we're talking complementary base pairing rules or Chargaff's rules are applying. And so if you have a T up here and you have an A below that, what's between my fingers? What holds them together? Hydrogen bonds. bonds. Hydrogen bonds, right, hydrogen bonds. Here we've broken those and we have exposed bases here in blue and here in pink. Now this RNA polymerase, notice what it is associating with. The blue template strand of the DNA. There's also a non-template strand that we're coloring pink. Does anybody know what template strand and non-template strand means? Isn't the template strand when like, it like is what the other one uses to like, um, sorry, it's like what it uses to like create, it's like new strand, like it goes off of that one? Absolutely, perfectly correct. You're right. As the name implies, non-template is not being used as a mold like the template strand is being used as a mold to help create the messenger RNA. And that has started to happen here in the middle of the diagram, right? So in, in yellow, we see the messenger RNA being transcribed. Now, what does this dark yellow ribbon. Anybody know what I'd find in here if I could look in here? The dark yellow solid color here that I'm outlining with my little arrow. Well, if I ask you what's in the dark pink or the dark blue ribbon, do, do you know what I'm talking about there? Is it phosphate? Oh, you're half right. It's phosphates it and sugars. Yeah, we call it the backbone of the molecule, right? So if it's in DNA, it's called deoxyribose sugar and phosphate groups linked together, right? If I go back in one of the earlier... Um, I should go back. Go to back one of the earlier slides. Here we go. See here? 
deoxyribose sugar phosphate, deoxyribose sugar phosphate. Then I have the same thing on the opposite side, although they're antiparallel. So the D, P, D, B, D, that makes up what's called the backbone. You have a backbone over here, you get a backbone over here in DNA. Okay. So back to my original question, if, if you look at the diagram here, oops, sorry. And you look at the dark yellow or the, or the solid yellow, whatever you want to call it. I have sugar and phosphate groups alternating. There, there's the backbone of this single-stranded messenger RNA. What do I know about the sugar here? Is it the same as the sugar up here? Sugars in these? It's ribose, right? Right. It's called ribose sugar. These are called deoxyribose sugar. So there, that's one difference between DNA and RNA is in the, the sugar part of the of the uh, nucleotide. And then of course these yellow little pegs, what do those represent? Well, you're all going to tell me the nitrogen bases, nitrogenous bases, right? I hope you'd all say that. So if I, let's go through and, and, and list some letters up here, pretend we'll, we'll come up with some letters here of the template strand. I'm going to give you a letter. I'm, I want you to tell me what the corresponding base in the messenger RNA is going to be. So if I have a C here, what's this going to be? G. Right. If this is a G. C. Right. If this is a T. A. If this is a A. U. Oh, darn. <clears throat> Thought I'd catch you there. Yeah, right. No T in RNA. Right? Does everybody understand what we're getting at here? So you can look at the base sequences here, the nitrogenous base sequences, the A's and the C's and the G's and the T's. And you ought to be able to tell me the sequence here in the messenger RNA. Obeying Chargaff's rules, but remembering that if you have an A in the DNA, there's no T in the RNA, you put a uracil. Everybody good with that? Okay. So this enzyme, again, starting at the promoter, going to continue along the double-stranded region until it gets to the terminator, then it's going to stop transcribing. And along the way, what's created? An ever-increasingly elongated messenger RNA strand, as you can see at the bottom. Notice what happens after we have formed these temporary hydrogen bonds between the messenger RNA and the template strand, then they break off from one another but we link the nucleotides together. Okay, so that's already happened down here. And look what happens to the DNA. It wraps back together again, doesn't it? So has there been any harm done to the recently transcribed segment of DNA in my lower diagram here? The answer, of course, is no. We've just utilized it, specifically the template strand, to create the messenger RNA strand. I'm going to stop here and ask, are there, are there questions on, on what I just described? Is this making sense? Thumbs up, thumbs down. You can give me, you can give me a, I am, that's not a, that's not a happy, that's a crying face. I am so upset. I don't understand what he's talking about. No, seriously, if you're not understanding what I'm talking about, say so. Um, because I, I do, I'll be happy to go over it again if you want. So, is this just on making proteins? Like, it doesn't have to do with DNA replication, right? That's right. DNA replication is a totally different ball of wax. And, and that we, doesn't have to do with mRNA, right? Correct. Nothing to do with okay. mRNA at all, period. Nope. Any okay. any MT or rRNA involves protein production, right? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you asked, Gabby, because a lot of students get the two mixed up. They get DNA replication mixed up with this. And you want to really, from the get-go, clearly understand there's a difference. Yeah. yeah, I think I used to think that they're the same thing. Well, I'm sure I did too. I'm sure I did too. Yeah, 
it's easy to get them mixed up. It's kind of like meiosis and mitosis. If you remember studying that in high school, they're very different, but there's some similar steps. Okay, so we're halfway there now in terms of the polypeptide we want to make in the cell. So once we get past transcription, um, and why don't I just play this short little video? Can do you guys see the video or do I need to reshare it? Yeah, sorry. Um, do you see the video now? Yes, no, maybe? Yep, I see. Yes. Okay, you, you guys are blacked out. I, 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 I can't see heads going up and down, so I'm not sure if you're seeing it or not. Okay, so let's play this. A structural gene is made up of a sequence of bases in a DNA. Let me pop up the volume here. I'm not sure if you're hearing this. A structural gene is made up of a sequence of bases in a DNA molecule consisting of a coding region with an upstream promoter and a terminator downstream of the coding region. The transcription of a gene into a messenger RNA sequence is initiated when RNA polymerase attaches to the promoter region and forms an open complex. RNA nucleotides are then polymerized from nucleotide triphosphates to make a messenger RNA. The messenger RNA sequence is elongated as the RNA polymerase moves down the DNA molecule until the RNA polymerase reaches the terminator region. Transcription is terminated when sequences in the terminator region are encountered. This causes RNA polymerase to dissociate from the DNA molecule and the completed transcript is released. Okay. So the second part now of protein synthesis is the translation of the messenger RNA into protein. And here's what we're going to be calling upon our ribosomal RNA, which basically comprises the ribosome and the transfer RNAs, which are going to transfer individual amino acids to the ribosome we then link the amino acids together and we make the polypeptide. As this indicates, um, this has multiple steps in it, sort of like transcription had several steps. So let's watch the second video because it focuses more on the prokaryotic cells and how translation occurs in them. And then we'll talk about it. In prokaryotic cells, translation is initiated by formation of an initiation complex consisting of the 30S ribosomal subunit, formal methionyl tRNA, and messenger RNA. The 50S ribosomal subunit then joins the complex. Proteins called initiation factors are also involved, but are not shown. The 70S ribosome has two sites to which transfer RNA carrying amino acids can bind. One is called the peptidyl or P site, and the other is called the acceptor or A site. There is also a third site called the exit or E site, where transfer RNAs are released. The initiating transfer RNA carrying formal methionine binds to the P site. A transfer RNA that recognizes the next codon and carries the second amino acid then moves into the A site. The formal methionine carried by the transfer RNA in the P site is then joined to the amino acid carried by the transfer RNA that just entered the A site by a peptide bond. The ribosome now advances a distance of one codon and the transfer RNA that carried the formal methionine is released at the E site. A transfer RNA carrying the next amino acid now moves into the A site where the anticodon on the transfer RNA matches the codon on the messenger RNA. The ribosome shifts down by a distance of one codon. 
As the shift occurs, the two amino acids on the transfer RNA in the P site are transferred to the new amino acid and the second transfer RNA is released from the E site. The ribosome continues to move along the messenger RNA and new amino acids are added to the growing polypeptide chain. Elongation of the polypeptide is terminated when a stop codon moves into the A site. A stop codon does not specify an amino acid and does not have a corresponding transfer RNA. The ribosome dissociates into the 30S and 50S subunits and the messenger RNA and protein are released. Okay, so this table basically gives you the various messenger RNA codon sequences and specifies which amino acid will be brought in by the transfer RNA when its anticodon complements these codon sequences in the messenger RNA. Note the presence of three stop codons, two here and the one here. Um, the start codon is often AUG. I always think of the abbreviation for the month of August. Start codon, where this process start, begins, right? Starts off um, and then ends with the stop codon. Um, this also codes for the amino acid methionine, it's called. You don't need to know the names of these amino acids, nor, of course, do you need to know the sequences uh, and what they correspond to in terms of an amino acid, but you should understand the concept here. Um, I'm going to stop there and ask, are there questions on the video? Are there con questions on the table? What that, what that means? Don't be afraid to ask a question, please. Everybody good with this? Yeah. Is this review for a lot of you or is it new? Hannah's like Ken, a little bit of both. Samuel, a little bit of both. Audra, Sam, a little bit of both. The Audra. Okay, how, for how many of you is this like the first time you've ever heard this? Anybody? No? Okay. Um, so there you go, Monica. There's a quick review of transcription and translation. Um, questions on either of those? It becomes important to understand this because when we talk later about mutations, you'll have a better understanding of what a mutation can do and its, and it's possible ramifications on the protein being made or not being made. So this is laying, laying some important groundwork, if you will, foundational stuff. Are you guys all the way done with chapter nine? Or are you still working on it? Have you studied tra uh, conjugation, transformation, transduction? Are, are those concepts you've heard about yet or not? No? Could you go over those? Mm -hmm. So let me... Um, Share the screen again. Okay, so what we're talking about here are mechanisms that bacteria can make use of to help. Um, sort of 
alter the genes in their chromosome or alter the genetic material in in their in their in themselves in the cell. Uh, I mentioned chromosome a second ago, but I got to be careful because are, are there other structures in a bacterial cell where we can find DNA other than the chromosome? The answer is yes. What specific structure do you know that a lot of bacteria have? Sometimes thought of or defined as extra chromosomal DNA. It's the little circle. Starts with a P. Plasmid. Right. Plasmids. So bacteria can can have new genes added in the form of plasmids or new genes added to the chromosome. So this is just, as it says on the slide, recombination processes whereby cells can acquire genes from other bacteria. And those are the, the three mechanisms that I, I listed just a few moments ago. So with conjugation, we have a physical connection between two cells, two bacteria, via what's called the sex pilus, or some people pronounce it pilus. It's literally a bridge across which genetic material moves, segments of DNA, basically, go across that little bridge from one cell to another, from a donor to a recipient cell. They use the term sex pilus. Sex is, is just such a misnomer because there's no sex going on here at all, but <clears throat> maybe somebody thought the pilus looked like a penis. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know the history behind it, but it does infer transfer of genetic material. So in that sense, it's kind of like sexual, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, that's what it's called. And you might remember her le learning about that or seeing that word back in the prokaryotic chapter, remember? So what we're looking at here <clears throat> is a cell in blue called the F plus cell. I know it's kind of hard to see this superscript letter, but it's a plus here. And this is an F minus. And the only thing that, the only difference between those two is that the F plus cell has the ability to form the sex pilus. It's going to be the donor. It's going to transfer what's called an F factor plasmid, shown here in red, it's going to replicate that and it's going to transfer it into the recipient cell and then it's going to have the f factor which will permit it to make its own sex pillus so in essence it becomes a what not an f minus it doesn't stay an f minus it becomes a f plus so if you're not plus you have the f factor or fertility factor plasmid in you and you can construct the pilus So here's that very process taking place between the F plus donor cell and the F minus recipient cell. The F plus makes this the sex pilus. It also replicates its fer fertility factor plasmid. That's that's what's going on here. That is transporting, being transported across the sex pilus, going into the F uh, minus cell, and it becomes F plus because it now has the fertility plasmid, F factor fertility. Now, this isn't, this isn't the only thing that can pass across the pilus is the F-factor plasmid. You can also have I hate talking over trains. You can also have R-factor plasmids across, uh, moving across. Anybody know what an R-factor plasmid can do? If you haven't studied this, the answer is I have no idea. But some of you may know R factor plasmids. They're resistance plasmids. They can carry drug resistance characteristics. 
to cells. It can be very beneficial to a cell to be able to negate the action of a drug, as you can imagine. So that's how drug resistance can sometimes build up in populations of cells, whereby a, a cell that has a drug resistant capability, because it has the plasmid, it has the instruction booklet to negate the effect of the penicillin, can transport that same informational booklet, if you will, in the form of the plasmid that replicates it and passes it on to another cell. Now, prior to that time, that, that recipient didn't know what to do in the presence of, of, of penicillin except die. <laughs> now it has the capability to negate the action of that drug perhaps. So being able to transfer genetic material can be really important for populations of bacteria. Um, you can watch these various videos. I'm not gonna play them now, but I think you should watch them. They're very good. Um, don't worry about the section that talks about uh, high frequency recombination or HFR transfer conjugation. That's not something you need to worry about. And I made mention of that in the PowerPoint uh, or the uh, Zoom lecture, I should say. So this again gets at the resistance plasmas I was talking about earlier. Transformation involves the uptake of DNA from the environment. And this specifically gets into the work of Frederick Griffith. He was a British medical officer in London in the late 20s. And again, I, I go through all of this in the Zoom lecture and explain what's going on with the R and S strains of strep. So if you haven't looked at this, you need to go in and look at it. Um, and basically what ends up happening is these R strain strep can become S strain by taking up the destroyed cell. When these cells are destroyed by the heat, they give off they rupture basically and some of the DNA spills out and the R strain strep absorbs the specific segments of DNA that allow it to become encapsulated. So the cells have been transformed, is the term we use, by the uptake of DNA from the surroundings. In this case it came from the S strain, heat killed S strain strep. And again, you can read over that. Transduction is talking about the role that viruses play in helping to transmit or transfer genetic material from one bacterial cell to another. This is really fascinating. <clears throat> We've talked about bacteriophages back in the uh, virus chapter, chapter six. These were those funny lunar lander shaped viruses, remember? Only here we're talking about the role they play in taking up donor cell DNA and transferring it to another bacterium. So the, the, the vector, if you will, is the virus. The virus is what vectors or transmits or transfers or carries bacterial DNA from one cell to another cell. Who would ever think that viruses assisted in DNA transfer between bacteria, but they do. So, so they can actually be somewhat helpful in, in some ways to, to bacterial populations. Even though we think of bacteriophages as being bad to a cell, and, it, and they are, they take over the whole cell's machinery, but it is another avenue by which you can shuffle the genetic deck of the uh, bacterial population. So more diversity, good thing for a population. And there's two different kinds of transduction, specialized and, and, uh, and uh, generalized. And you can, again, watch those videos that, that I put together that, that talks about those. It, you definitely need to be into chapter nine and almost through it by now we're trying to stay on schedule.
How about, how about questions over what you've been studying? What's causing you angst? Again, I've uploaded all the lectures. So this is a time for you to, to seek clarification. What is not clicking? What would you like to review that you've been studying and it's just not clicking? Everybody's ready for the quiz. No questions. So I was late. Um, I got stuck in traffic on the way here. I missed the part. What specifically is on the quiz? So I know. 9.1 and 9.2. That's it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, if you have any questions, um, I got plenty of things to do. But this is our time. This is the time to to ask if something's not making sense. I don't want to pull teeth here without anesthesia, but you guys leave me no choice. Okay. Well, again, get into chapter 10 soon. Um, even though that's not on the test. You know, coming up a week from Thursday, definitely try to stick to the schedule. All right. Um, I'll be here for the next 20 minutes or so. I need to run to the library and drop some stuff off, but I'll be here for a few more minutes. If you have any questions, stick around. Otherwise, I'll see you in lab or see you next Tuesday. <laughs>